welcome back to my channel. It is that time again for another one of my Pearson comprehensive guides. Each month I put out a brand new comprehensive guide that focuses on a specific Pearson. Each month my patrons over on Patreon vote on what Pearson I'm going to focus on and this month they chose the earlobe Pearson. So like the very basic standard earlobe Pearson which I'm pretty excited about because I feel like everyone focuses on all other Pearsons and the lobe piercing kind of gets left behind because it's so common. So if you've never seen one of my Pearson comprehensive guides before, basically I break it down into five sections. The first one is what exactly is said Pearson, the pain and procedure of getting the Pearson done, the healing and aftercare of said Pearson, the jewelry sizing, and then everyone's favorite, the jewelry options. So basically we just do a little rundown, make sure that you know exactly what Pearson we're talking about, and then any general information that you may need to know about getting this Pearson, taking care of this Pearson, and then everything moving forward. So so let's go ahead and get started with what is an earlobe piercing or as many people say they don't usually say earlobe they just say lobe piercing. So this is probably the most popular piercing out of all the piercings this is the one that the majority of people with piercings have. All ages seem to get this piercing including babies which I'm not going to dive too much into that but unlike cartilage piercings where you get it when you're a teenager and up earlobe piercings you can get as young as a baby or middle school age child or beyond. So this piercing refers to the soft tissue that is at the bottom of your ear and this area actually has a name other than lobe, it's the lobule, which then gets shortened to lobe. Typically this piercing happens in the very center of your lobe and you can actually get more than one dependent on placement as well as your anatomy. And then you get into things like transverse lobe piercings or high lobe piercings. But for this video, we are gonna focus primarily on just the basic lobe piercing. So now that you know exactly which piercing we are talking about, let's move on to the pain and procedure. I feel like out of all the comprehensive guides that I've done, this one's gonna be the one that's like quick, to the point, like everyone knows about the lobe piercing. There's nothing too wild about it or anything that you really need to be like, oh no, about. It's very basic. Pain and procedure of getting this done. Most would say that it is one of the least painful piercings to get done. Mostly feels like a pinch and on a scale of one to 10, one being absolutely nothing and 10 being the worst thing ever. Most would tell you it's about a one. Some may tell you a two, kind of depends. There may be a pinch in there because there is a needle going through you, but compared to other piercings, this one is really not that bad. Unlike other ear piercings, this one is a pretty fleshy area. So it's not going through cartilage at all. It is just going through your flesh. And when you get this piercing done, much like with other piercings, you know, your piercer is going to sterilize everything, mark the placement, let you look at the placement, see if you need to make any adjustments to it, and then we'll proceed with the actual piercing. Most of the time, this piercing will take place from the front to the back, so they're gonna take the little needle and it'll go from the front into the back. Sometimes you may see it from the back to the front, more often than not, front to back. And as always, your piercer may choose to use a clamp. Clamp usage really depends on your piercer. It's up to personal preference. Some think that clamps get in the way, some think that they do help. Now for this particular piercing, piercers most likely we'll use a clamp just because it is a little bit more flexible and a little bit more movable unlike cartilage piercings, which are pretty much steady in place. But if you try and grab your lobe and try and get a good grip on it, it's gonna move a little bit more. So oftentimes piercers, even if they don't use clamps for other things, will use it for this piercing. And because this is a very common piercing, and again, the one that the majority of people have, if you see a piercer pull out a piercing gun, run. Don't, don't be in that shop, go elsewhere. Don't, don't pass go, collect $200, whatever it is, Monopoly style, get out. I know the majority of us have probably at some point gotten a piercing with a piercing gun, but just seriously, if you see a piercer bring one out, get out. Next up, we have healing and aftercare. What should you expect with a lobe piercing? So like other fleshy piercings, this one has a much shorter healing time than cartilage piercings. So this one takes about six to eight weeks to be healed, which in the grand scheme of piercings is so so short and that's because it is a fleshier area this one heals pretty fast compared to other ones however that's only if you care for it 
correctly. So how should you care for it? Not using that stuff that that one store gives you because that is not good aftercare solution. So there are two things you can do. You can either make your own solution or you could do a pre-made solution. If you go with pre-made, I recommend Neomed. I do have a coupon code with them. So if you would like a discount off of Neomed sprays, my code is in the description below. But that to me is the best one. You basically just spray it on there, let it soak a little bit and then rinse it off. And if you forget to rinse it off, it is not the end of the world because the pre-made solutions are made with the idea in mind that you're gonna spray it on there and leave it. Whereas if you make your own, you do wanna rinse it off because it could end up being too strong and irritate the Pearson site. But if you do decide to make your own solution, make sure you are using the correct measurements. Because a lot of people tend to forget this part. So what are the correct measurements? The first thing you do is you get eight ounces of distilled or bottled water. Don't use tap water because there's stuff in tap water that's not really good for a brand new Pearson. I know we drink it and we're sitting there going like, oh, I shouldn't put that on my Pearson. Why am I drinking it? Questions for another time. But use eight ounces of distilled or bottled water, room temperature or a little bit warmer. Cold's really not gonna help you too much. And then with that eight ounces of water, you are gonna mix one eighth to one fourth of a teaspoon of non-iodized sea salt. And don't go over one fourth of a teaspoon because just because you put more salt in there does not mean that it's gonna clear up anything faster and in fact could irritate it and prolong the healing process. Make sure that you are not over cleaning your Pearson. Twice a day should be enough unless you notice a lot of crusties then a third time is fine. I always suggest once in the morning and once in the evening if you do find throughout the day that there are a lot of crusties just in the middle of the day clean it up a little bit three times should be fine. Stick around two. You don't wanna do any less than that and you really don't wanna go over three times a day because that can irritate the Pearson more and prolong the healing process. Make sure you are not using things like alcohol products, Neosporin or Bactine. Let's start with Bactine. Bactine tells you on their website to not use them on a Pearson. I feel like if a company is telling you not to use their product, you should probably listen. Alcohol products shouldn't be used because they dry out the skin and you definitely don't want that to happen around a brand new Pearson. And the problem with Neosporin or any cream is that it clogs the puncture wound, which is essentially what a Pearson is. It clogs it and doesn't allow it to drain. Remember those crusties I was telling you about? Those are actually good. Yes, you're gonna wanna wipe them away. You don't want them to accumulate too much, but when you see crusties, that's actually good. That's your body flushing out the wound site so that any bacteria can get out. So if you put something like Neosporin or any other creams in there, it's not gonna be able to drain correctly. And all of these things are just way too harsh for a Pearson especially a brand new one. The little thing to keep in mind with aftercare is to not mess with the jewelry. And that means don't spin it, don't turn it, don't do any of those things that that one place told you. <coughs> Clip. <coughs> something in my throat. Don't spin your jewelry, don't mess with it. You don't need to do that. And the reason why you don't mess with your jewelry is that it can cause little abrasions when you're turning it like that, which can further irritate the piercing and prolong the healing process. Again, make sure you're clearing away any crusties. You don't want them to build up. You want them to happen, but you don't want them to build up. And if you are gonna use things like Q-tips, just make sure that the little fibers or threads aren't wrapping around the jewelry. That's always the biggest concern with Q-tips is that if the threads wrap around the jewelry, it's going to irritate the piercing more. Now I personally use Q-tips. I just make sure that nothing's being left behind and I tend to have pretty good luck with it. And then also watch out for things like your hair getting wrapped around the jewelry cause that can also lead to irritation. All right, time to move on to the sections. That's everyone's favorite part, jewelry. Let's start with jewelry sizing. Now, unlike cartilage piercings, when you get a low piercing done, it's most likely gonna be a 20 gauge or an 18 gauge. It's gonna be pretty small. Length really depends on the thickness of your lobe as well as to account for swelling. And the cool thing about lobe piercings, or really any piercing, but we're talking about the lobe piercing here, is that if you don't like the 20 gauge or the 18 gauge, you can eventually stretch up. Now, if this is a brand new piercing, you don't wanna stretch up right after getting a brand new one. Let that thing heal, let it sit for a little bit, and then you can go through the process of stretching it up, kind of like what I did with mine. And then what are your jewelry options for a low piercing? Pretty much your jewelry options are endless when it comes to this piercing. This is one of the most versatile piercings ever. Now, when you get it done initially, you are gonna start off with like a stud. It could be a flat back. Some places will give you the butterfly back. Butterfly backs are notoriously problematic. I would recommend against them. I would definitely suggest getting a stud that has a flat back on it, kind of like either internally threaded or threadless or anything like that, it's gonna be better for the health of your piercing 
overall. If you have the option to opt for something other than butterfly back, definitely do so. Your piercing will be much happier. And then once it's healed, you can either stick with like your standard lobe jewelry or you can switch to dangles, which dangles are pretty fun, something that I miss, but then when you stretch up, you can do fun things like this, which this is a plug that has a dangle attached to it. So you can still do it even after you've stretched up, but dangles are just so fun. There's something about them. But your options are pretty much endless when it comes to a lobe piercing. You can stick with the studs, you can stick with hoops, you can stick with dangles or you can do things that you would find in other piercings like say a circular barbell otherwise known as a horseshoe and a lot of this also depends on the size you're pierced at so 20 is going to be the standard low piercing size that's going to be the one that if you go to like target or something and you see stud jewelry that's going to be that size maybe even 22 but that's really pushing it on the size but if you decide you want to do like 18 or higher you can have a lot of other options open up to you so that is a comprehensive guide to the earlobe or low Pearson. Let me know in the comments below if this was your first introduction to Pearson's. Like, was the lobe Pearson your very first Pearson? I feel like for the majority of us, it was. Also, raise your hand if you were personally victimized by a Pearson gun when you were younger. Because, hi, all three of my lobe Pearsons were done with a Pearson gun. I wish I could take it back, but at least they made it out in the end. It just took a while for them to heal. But let me know in the comments below. How many lobe piercings you have? Do you just have the traditional one? Or are you like me and you have multiples? Have you stretched yours? When did you get your, give me all the information about your lobe piercing and how it was to get done. Mine was rough for all three. Special thank you to my patrons. You can help support the channel on Patreon while having access to videos early, viewing patron only content and more. But that is it for this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to give it a big thumbs up. Don't forget to go down there and hit that subscribe button as well as that notification bell so YouTube will let you know when I upload next. But until next time, bye all. Mm -hmm.